Hi, and welcome to the new property show. I'm Steve McMenamin. On this show, Joshua and Steve talk about the cost of living and credit files. Our panel discusses wholesale versus retail part two, but first, Zed on building brands. Zed Nasheed, welcome back to the new property show. Thank you for having me, Steve. Uh, we finished last time discussing brand. Um, so brand is one thing that you're known for. Even if you're not in a room you're talked about, that's good or bad. What do you think of brand and what does brand mean to you and how can people build it? I have a saying in business, A, B, E, and also, you know, as salespeople, we always believe in ABC, always be closing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got always be educating and always be branding, okay? So I'm all about building a personal brand. Because if you think some of the best, well, look at the world's biggest organizations, yeah, people have created it back in the days and all that, but as much as I'm in the property game, real estate's not about properties, it's about people. We're dealing with people. Doctors, you have to be nice to people. Everything's people related. So what do you need in life? Good communication skills, good negotiation skills, and a brand to back you up to build that has credibility as well. So I've built my brand pretty much from scratch. I tell my staff members, wherever they go, always be branding. The room should know that you're a state agent. The room should know your energy because you always get one impression to make a last impression. Your first impression is always your last impression. So wherever you are, make sure every single person in that room knows that you're a real estate agent. And I don't call myself a real estate agent. So we've designed Z Real Estate for the marketplace of tomorrow so that we call, can call ourselves wealth creators via real estate. Again, that's Smart. me branding. Yeah? Excellent. So it's always about branding. You should always be branding yourself regardless of wherever you, you are. So if you're in a room full of 40 people, 39 people should know that you're a real estate agent. And that one person you're not going to talk to is just that one person like, oh, <laughs> I want to stay away from her or him. You know who that is? Steve Mack. No. <laughs> I was going to say another agent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, true. That's your competition. Oh, well said. Well That's said. your competition. Well said. No, Pizza. even with competition, even with other state agents out there, you know, there's enough uh, bread for everybody else out there. There's enough room for everybody out there because in life you don't get what you want. You get what you deserve and what you are. Excellent. How good's that? That's not bad. I'm going to give you a 10. <laughs> uh, he has the confidence of a real estate agent but the thinking of tomorrow. Let's talk about tomorrow. Where is Zed Nasheed going? Where's the brand going, okay? I, I would like to get this on camera. Sure. One year from now, how's Queensland going? How's your brand? And what records or what impact are you gonna, what are you gonna break? I'm very fortunate that Zed Real Estate is run by my amazing brothers. There's four shareholders and I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. There's Marcy, Case and T. One of the biggest reasons why this business has had expansion after expansion is because the foundation of the business is very strong. The biggest mistake that a salesman can make is jump into sales and their salespeople, they jump into business ownerships and the business falls apart because as salespeople, what do we hate? Paperwork. Admin. Yep. I hate it. You hate it? I hate it. Everybody <laughs> hates paperwork Nobody as a salesman. Nobody likes it. Nobody likes to touch any paperwork. Public yeah? bookkeepers. Ex <laughs> <laughs> so my brothers are running the foundation of the business and that's what we've had to merge into Gold Coast. And Gold Coast is such a beautiful city. And there's only 800,000 people out there. So I feel like there's just so much you know, potential in that city. So I actually genuinely, the Barons have already built in Melbourne. I just genuinely want to take over uh, Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, we will be rebranding our third office in Gold Coast. I was just up there. You know, it depends on you know, some terms and conditions that I've of you course. Know, um, set. But my next move will be uh, Vaucluse or Double Bay. I'm going straight to Sydney. Uh, there's a company that we're currently talking to and they're looking at rebranding to our brand. Um, and uh, yeah, so hopefully by next year I'll have uh, Sydney and then WA. Funny I then, I was literally just in Vaucluse and Double Bay yesterday. Uh, I went there for inspiration. I, I saw the housing there. Sydney, uh, Sydney Drive is a little bit more aggressive. Yeah. Um, park, car parking is an issue. But I can tell you those price tags up there and those water views were spectacular. It's got a Z Especially, on it. It's definitely got a Z on it. I can see those houses selling, looking back onto the Harbour Bridge uh, for some exceptional value. Uh, it's fantastic. So, love to see that Sydney journey. So, Thank that'll you. be this year or next year in Turf or Clues? Next year. Next year. Now, let's, talk, let's, take it back to, um, let's take it back to the people. You have quite an, an array of staff. How does somebody come to work for your brand? They just got to simply reach out to me. Yesterday, I had somebody reach out and... Um, you know, on my socials, he said, no way you responded back. Yeah. <laughs> no way I can't. Is this Zed it's himself? I said, yep, you're talking to Zed. Send me your number. Yeah. 
call them up. How are you? Good? Should have yeah, catfished I can't believe. Him. Huh? Should have catfished him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I said, how you doing? How long have you been in real estate? Two years. Good. I said, all right, tell me why you should be employed by Z Real Estate. He said, because I'm young, energetic, hustling. And I got, I said, you got goals? He said, I got goals. I said, what was your goal last year? He said this. I said, what was your goal last week? He said, I had to connect to 50 people. I said, all right, all right double it. And you got yourself a job at Z. So I hired my Uber driver in Gold Coast as well. She wow. drove me around. She's like, I'm from yeah, the Europe lover. I said, done, because experience doesn't mean anything. As long as you're hungry and you got the drive. There is, because salespeople are made, Stevie. They are. They're not, they're not born. So and then, I actually like that tactic. Yeah. Um, who's going to know the streets better than an Uber driver? Really? Um, yep. They're going to know all the hotspots. They're going to know the drivers. They're going to know the parking. I hired a pizza delivery uh, driver too. Just anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. And in terms of branding, um, let's talk about this. Some people say I'm not ready. I'm never ready. I don't want to. I'm You'll not, never I'm be ready. Never going to be ready. Don't want to speak on camera. Don't want to do like that. Where should they be seen? So is it media? Is it podcasts or is it YouTube? Is it TikTok? What's going to get people the most attention if they had one to two channels to work with? What channels should they focus on and how often should they post? I post one um, content a day. Yeah. Consistently, I've been posting for the last six years. Uh, people, it's like I went into a seminar 10 years ago, Steve, and one of the presenters uh, said in the room that newspaper marketing will be finished. And everybody laughed at him back in the room. Mm -hmm. And I used to do open homes and people, our buyers would show up with newspapers, the financial review or the news times and, you know, say open times. And we had to put our open times the latest by 11 o'clock Monday morning so people can get, you know, it could get published by Thursday and people would show up to our open homes. And everybody laughed at them uh, in the room. But look at what's happened now. Like, we sell real estate all around Melbourne, all around. The boys would just ask me before... Uh, and they're in finance, like, how do you keep up from going from one suburb to another suburb? Because I just drive there and I negotiate on the phone. My expertise is not stop in one suburb. What do I get paid for? Think about it. Why do people hire sales agents? To negotiate, to market, because they don't have the same skill set as them. Or they don't have the confidence or that self-esteem as them, yeah, as a salesman. So you appoint a sales agent to negotiate and to tap into the database and create that wow factor look in order to get the price. You might, you know, call me for a property saying, hi, Zed, I'm looking at buying a house out there. Can, this is my budget. But, you know, I always tell my friends and families, don't buy a house with me, but sell your properties with me. I've mm -hmm. got you so good. Because I know that if your missus likes the house, you're gone, Stevie. Yeah. That's why they say where the wife wears the pants and the husband wears the shorts. <laughs> so I always negotiate with the wives. Excellent. Sorry, it sounds a bit, you know, sexist. But <laughs> we, cover, we cover everything on here. Okay. Uh, last bit of advice. Um, what would you like to say to the viewers out there about your message, about um, your family and the impact you're making on this earth? Um, because I believe, personally, it's, it's not who you are, it's what you say, it's what you do, but it's the difference and how you make others feel. So what message do you have for the viewers out there? Words are very powerful. powerful. It can either make someone or break someone. Think twice about what comes out of your mouth. Be yourself, be authentic, and the more authentic that you are, the fact that you've embraced yourself, then you can share yourself to the world in a very honest way. So life comes in with you embracing yourself because there's only one person that looks like you out of 8 billion people now. So embrace who you are. And if people like it, good. And if people want to go for a walk, let them walk away. It's as simple as that. Life is beautiful. Beautiful. There's only 86,400 seconds in a day and 10,441 minutes in one week. So make the most of every single day. Said Simple machine. Said. Amazing. Our time is up. You're amazing. Thank you. We'll see you again. Thank you very much. The materials used in your property construction have a significant impact on its long-term performance, durability and energy efficiency. Careful planning and selection of materials and products and the way they are combined can improve the cost effectiveness of the overall property whilst reducing the environmental impact. It is important to understand the site and the surroundings of the build and what products will suit that environment. Examples of this are, if the build is high up on a hill, it may be subject to extreme elements and you may need to use products that are resistant to high winds. Or if it is in a bushfire area, non-combustible products should be a priority. The quality of the materials used is the difference with a premium construction and an average build. There are many quality manufacturers in Australia that produce high quality products 
and it is important to understand which building material is the best fit for your build. For example, Little Hampton Bricks and Pavers was established well over 120 years ago and is one of the country's unique boutique brick manufacturers. Little Hampton has retained its original flexible heating processes that has helped with innovation in its products which extends to textures, colours and finishes on their range of bricks and pavers. Little Hampton supplies its quality products to projects all over Australia and the world. Accent Aluminium Windows and Doors has been in the industry for more than 35 years. This award-winning company produces high-quality custom products that will even cater for extreme conditions in Australia. Craftsmanship, obviously, isn't something that just happens. It requires a great deal of time, patience and effort. Accent is well known in the industry for its aluminium doors and windows that last. Alright, well welcome back. Uh, today's topic is credit files uh, and really how you deal with them. Yeah, so the important thing to, I guess, understand is we, we've seen a like a massive shift in credit files, uh, credit file information, mm -hmm. where I, I often talk about places like the US and the UK have always, or for a long time, people actually know their score and, you know, as an example, you could walk up to someone in their street and say, oh, what's your credit score? Now, they may punch you in the face and refuse to tell you, but they know what their score is. Well, in Australia, for the longest time, people had no idea. And we're seeing this shift where people are starting to actually realise what their credit, credit file means, credit score means, and you're seeing real estate agents, you know, because they need to thin down these, you know, they might get 50 applicants mm -hmm. for a house and they've got to thin that down to 10. They'll start doing credit checks on people and understanding, you know, what kind of credit worthiness of their, their tenants and their they're these payers, these people that pay. So you're seeing more activity on people's credit files. And because of that, we've seen had to see a shift where um, previously we had uh, what was called negative credit reporting, mm -hmm. which is basically do everything right, don't do anything wrong, or sorry, don't do anything wrong and you're fine. Now, then we went to positive credit reporting, mm -hmm. which, which said don't do anything wrong, but also do the right thing occasionally or do the right yeah. thing as well. So you kind of had the two sides of that. Guilty to proven and, innocent, really. Yeah. And yeah. then now yeah. we're actually seeing this whole other thing that's actually only just now coming in called um, Equifax One, where you're moving into things like repayment history mm -hmm. and you know more complex algorithms that go pretty crazy, but it starts to really look at profiles as a whole and when you talk about credit scores going up and down and it they're more, changing um, quite a lot. Almost behavioural uh, now. So one, one used to be a science and, and maths. And one is now behavioural because it's it's actually based on the I guess the frequency of repayments, uh, and you could actually that's actually quite dangerous. So thinking out loud here, but if you've got five number of loans <laughs> and five defaults, or five uh, and you mean a couple of skip payments and you, you're playing catch up, your credit file could go to control. Hmm. How do people um, how do people get assess their credit file? It's a pretty simple. For some people, but how do you actually get a report? You want to try and minimise the number of yeah. like types of inquiries you have as well. So yeah. if you've got, you can kind of tell the kind of client that has a lot of unsecured products mm -hmm. coming through, buy now, pay laters, yeah. um, you know, unsecured personal loans, and it can kind of paint a picture. So if you've got a whole heap of those type of inquiries, you think, mm -hmm. what is the harm in this zip pay or this after pay or that mm -hmm. Klarna or whatever it might be, hum, you know, th there is a huge impact. So too much of that sort of says to the bank, this person doesn't really have control of their everyday finances. And it might be fair, it might be unfair, but that is the way it is. So I sort of say to clients, look, try and balance it out with some secured stuff. Some, uh, and it's also over a five year period. So you've got five years worth of inquiry stacked up there. So if you weren't a little trigger happy around the last couple of years, and I know like Steve and the Speaking yeah. Finance crew are awesome at only having one touch on a file, but I see like, clients coming into me and they've got four touches over a six week period with Toyota Finance because somebody within the dealership who's probably not super experienced has just punched in an inquiry each time and that then excited. detrimentally they, hits them. It's, they're, two, they're two triggers predominantly unless they're out there regularly uh, spending at JB Hi-Fi is going to be they've got a new, moved into a new house so they need furniture so that's a white goods um, purchase so they're, they're kind of the Harvey Norman ones yep. or um, their car blows up <laughs> Now they're shopping for a new car, so the I think they should be more educated prior to doing that. As I said, it's a, it's it seems to be that there's a trigger that just happens to that because it's normally in a I guess in a cluster. It's a life um, event. Yeah, it's yep. definitely a life event. So obviously the hot topic at the moment that mm -hmm. everyone will talk about, and I don't want to say the 
the phrase, but I've got to say it, that cost of living, right? It's just going to constantly get beaten, beaten. Yeah. But the, there's obviously ways where you can, you know, people will talk about ways you can generate more income, but obviously the first thing, the first step is obviously where I can I cut back yeah. expenses. So when we talk about debt consolidation, mm -hmm. now, um, there is a bunch of different ways that you can do it, and either Josh or myself mm -hmm. can help with either of them, right? Where you talk about something, whether you've just so happened to over that period rack up a little bit of credit card mm -hmm. debt, or you've racked mm -hmm. up some personal loans, and a couple of little things. It's important to understand that when people talk about it, it's like the debt pyramid, mm -hmm. right? The thing at the top is the you know the, the food pyramid that we're not supposed to eat, yep. but we yep. perhaps all eat too much of. Um, but you know, the debt, the credit card debt, the 20%, mm -hmm. that kind of above. Then you go your steps down and your thing right at the bottom is obviously like your mortgage rates. Yep. And it's understanding that if you can put your debt closer down to that bottom, whether you do it through property or whether you can do it with so just consolidating. What you almost line. call foundational debt, so secure debt uh, yeah. is, is basically what it sounds like. One is one is uh, bread and one is diamonds. Um, yep. and, and the diamonds always going to grow. And I, I think sometimes in terms of just managing um, cash flow, because obviously you're talking about uh, rates, oh, sorry, repayments going from 2600 bucks or $2,200 a month up to 36 that some of those things have got to go. Um, and also getting rid of credit cards is not a bad thing, because you can still have your own money, but have it on a Visa MasterCard. You don't have to have a credit card. Um, you can still get the points, you get all the benefits. So I think, I honestly think credit cards nowadays are almost out the door. Uh, unless you know how to manage them, why would you pay 18% to 22% on money <laughs> that you can essentially get for 6%? Um, and yeah. to be honest, like that was that was still charging us twenty two back yeah. when mortgage rates were ones and twos. Like I, yeah. I don't know about yeah. you guys, but I didn't see mortgage uh, credit card rates drop. No when, one has, when, no when mortgage rates that. were yeah. dropping at one point nine percent. The optimal way to manage that too is to like leverage having money hitting like yeah. an offset account for your mortgage. Have your credit card pay yeah. it on it all month, but make sure it's within a budget time tolerance that you've kind of allowed, and then take the money out and pay it off. So. For 29 out of 30 days in the month, mm -hmm. you've saved mortgage on your uh, interest on your mortgage, and then what you've done is then recycled it back and paid it off before the 18% starts to get you on the credit card side. Actually, if everybody could manage it like that, it's probably yeah. about 5% of people that do. But if everybody managed it like that, the banks wouldn't be offering it anymore. It's as simple as that. It's a product catch that use it this way, but people get lax and lazy. Fall Which into is habits. really what they want yeah, um, exactly. because they want you to charge the 18%. Correct. I actually have a genuine question here. Um, if someone comes into you and they've actually got a Amex card, so the Amex is something there, do you see that as a like as a sign of wealth, or what do you see that as? Um, because at the end of the day, it's still a credit card. But how does a bank view an Amex? Because it's meant to be, it's a different way of credit scoring, isn't it? Oh, I mean, look, for yeah. me, Amex credit card is someone who likes to pay fees, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I, yeah. I had a narrow window there where I actually had an Amex card because my yeah. bank offered it as a jewel, yeah. so they yeah. gave you the MasterCard and Amex, and I played around with it for a little while, and at the end, I couldn't see the value because every time it was 5% more, 6% more, and I was like, what's what's the, what am I actually getting? Oh, I get some extra points, but, I mean, we all know that points... They're not really the be all and end all. Yeah, you can absolutely do mm -hmm. some great things with them, but they it's they're like a casino, right? Like the house isn't gonna offer you points unless no. they know they're getting some more in the back. So it's like saying you're getting a tax benefit yeah. and people go, Oh, but you've actually got to spend the money in order to make mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So same thing with those points on the Amex, I had the same, a complimentary card. And in the moment they started jacking up the fees, I just went, nah, I'm, I'm good here. Yeah. And to get rid of and, it. And so I started a lot of it now I find it. the points where, like, I think when I started, the Amex was two two points yep. per dollar. And then it dropped back to 1.5. And I'm like, yeah, they clearly they it was generous and they knew it was generous and they cut it back and it's suddenly not as yep. generous anymore. So you've got to play in those play in those margins, right? I'd find the clients mm. probably more so with those products. So either old school and it's ingrained mm. in them or mm. the literally money's not really an object. So they go, I don't care. Just okay. keep doing it. Excellent. So that'd be another, um, that'd be a great topic. Money's no object. Yeah. Uh, it'd be a wow. fantastic one to have on the show. It'd be great to have you back uh, to discuss credit files in more detail. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll speak to you soon. No worries. Um, and just really depending, as I said, in terms of the pricing that you're charging in those for those extra features, uh, what about extra time at the end in terms of getting the landscaping fences and blinds pulling? So normally you've got to get a certificate of occupancy, which is most important. Are you putting those items in after handover or will, they be ha or will the house be handed over 
with those items complete. No, no, that will be part of the contract mm -hmm. and is done by the builder. So I just pick the builder who's happy to do the turnkey. If some clients mm -hmm. said they said they have extra money, they can do they can outsource after the handover. So it depends upon them. But if some some clients said they want turnkey finish, so I just talk to the builder who can do that and everything in the contract. And when they finish the house, everything is turnkey. I think what you can do is a counter argument there, possibly, and by my way in on that a bit. But sometimes with the wholesale, we, we could be a hundred grand cheaper than a than a custom um, builder. Um, but what you look at is you can do a wholesale product with some custom features. So the argument can go the other mm. way. You can change the facade, you can change the bricks, we can change the roof pitch, um, and we can certainly we can put a few upgrades in. So I think you can get the wholesale feel with a personalised touch. So you might just go set a 900 by 900 showers. You're allowed to put a 1500 shower in if there's provision. But do you find um, that you've been able to make some custom changes to some of your wholesale products if required? So what what I think is, when you are paying a mortgage, like there's an owner occupied, you are paying for uh, 30 years. And if you, when you come home, the home should feel, you should relax over there. It, you are not building a pigeonholes. Just mm -hmm. do all work all day, come back and move into the pigeon. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not like that kind of house. I don't build these kind of things. Mm -hmm. I said, if this is your home, everything should be designed by you. So you can feel when, when you, the husband and wife have arguments, say, oh, this is designed by me. This is designed by me. You know this what they you about? choose. Retail versus wholesale. <laughs> no, no, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So in this way, they can feel that every feature, they can feel them who designed this, who choose this one. So this mm -hmm. only benefit you can get in a retail one, not in the... I want to add, like uh, having as a customer, if I have a clear expectations of what I want, that's important. Plus, also, it's very important who you're dealing with. If you are, can trust the people, uh, you know, you're dealing with, whether it's retail or wholesale, I think that makes uh, life a lot more easier for anyone who's choosing between the two. I think one of the things that have changed, though, and we talked about this in another episode, was that people don't live in their houses for very long. My, my mum's mm. lived in a house for 50 years, um, yes. but I've typically only ever laid stayed in a house for two years. So every time I build a property, I'm building that typically as my next investment. So it would actually yeah. um, be the, I guess, the mindset that you're moving into it for. So that's where I'm feeling the custom could be, you could overcapitalize because people have built houses, then they go to sell it. You've got the resale point of view. Yes, you might have the pink wall. <laughs> you yeah. might have the, some <laughs> pigeon holes, which you don't like, <laughs> some pigeon holes. <laughs> but then you've got to sell the property. <laughs> you've got a custom design for a person that suits one particular person yeah. with pink walls mm -hmm. and now you've got to sell that to 99 other people um, where in both aspect you saved a hundred thousand dollars and I think the the idea of property uh, has changed the family home yes is important and and I'm not against that but I think it should be a wealth accumulation process rather than just building building for um, I guess building for the passion but not even, I've been stuck with property myself where I've gone mm -hmm. to sell it. I did a red splashback once. Guess what they didn't like? <laughs> the red splashback. I loved it. Um, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But what about, uh, what are your... Probably depends on how long you want to stay in the property as well. You mm -hmm. know, like, and what stage of life you're at. If you're at a, a more of a preservation age or you, you think you're going to, you know, you're approaching your, your later 50s or something and this is going to be the house that you're staying in, you know, for the next 10, 15 or 20 years, that's very different to probably any time before that. So... I think it's just about the mindset of how long you're actually going to stay in that house. And I definitely think that probably in your 20s, 30s, maybe even 40s and, and potentially beyond, um, if you're wanting to build wealth as well, then you should keep it in mind the type of extras that you are going to implement in the property. Because, you know, if you're spending an extra 50, 60, 70, $100,000, it's nice to know that you can get that back if you were to sell it. And I think this argument is going to continue on forever. Yeah. Um, I think there is a space. <laughs> there, is, there is a space. There is a space for both. I think there is no real answer apart from um, wholesale for fixed price and confidence, yes. um, retail uh, for in between, and customer if you've got unlimited pockets and ready to go, um, and you can have your pink your pink walls, yeah, you really and you can have those. The good news is you can paint back over them. You can. But it's, it was a fun debate, and it's a lot of fun, but I think most importantly, you deal with somebody that has the right knowledge, okay? Yes. So I think when, when hunting for a consultant, and this is why it was a bit of fun today, you need to deal with somebody that has done what you're about to do. Yes. So for example, if you've built custom homes before and you've got experience, the person doing it. Nothing worse than being sold something by somebody that rents a property yeah. 
and cycles to work. Uh, pardon the pun, but it's a, it's a different story. But um, really good debate. But um, just before we wrap up, so let's let's uh, go around the circle here: retail, custom, or um, wholesale. All of us wholesale. Oh, definitely custom. Yeah, custom. I think we know. <laughs> Wholesale. Wholesale. Yeah. Wholesale custom. Wholesale <laughs> <laughs> custom. Yeah, That's the most it's a bit of both. That's the most <laughs> nah, wholesale. Uh, guys, been a really good debate. Thanks for jumping on the new property show, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Dave. Thank you. Thanks. That's all for this week, and thank you for watching. If you'd like to see our full episodes, please check out our website, thenewpropertyshow.tv, and we'll see you guys again next week.